Welcome to chapter 23 of the Canadian Securities Course, volume 2. In this chapter, we are going to be looking at structured products. So we're going to start by going over an overview of structured products. Basically, they are passive investment vehicles that are financially engineered uh, to provide a specific risk and return characteristic. They're also designed to have less risk than their underlying assets while providing higher risk adjusted returns than conventional investments. Now I do have some examples here and we are specifically going to be going over five different types of structured products. So we are going to be going over principal protected notes or PPNs. Um, they're basically bank issued debt securities with returns linked to an equity index, mutual fund, ETF, or basket of stocks. We will go over some examples of uh, principal protected notes as well. Um, we're also going to look at market linked GICs. These are pretty similar to principal protected notes. However, there is a few differences in the way that they work and you'll see that later on. We're also going to look at split shares. So split shares, they're equity securities with separate claims on the dividend and capital cash flow from a holding of underlying stocks. Basically, you're splitting a common share into a uh, preferred share that trades dividends and a capital share, which will only uh, will, which will get 100% of the capital appreciation from that stock. You also have mortgaged back securities. These are medium to long term bonds with equal claim on the principal and interest cash flow from a pool of mortgages. There's also asset backed securities. These are short to medium term bonds with equal claim on the principal and interest cash flows from a pool of receivables. Now, some pros and cons to structured products. The pros, they are professionally managed. They do have economies of scale as well. Um, and of course, diversification. The cons, however, are that they are difficult to assess their inherent risks. And also they are illiquid. A lot of them you will have to lock yourself in if you do purchase them. They do have large built-in costs as well, and that's basically because a lot of them are protecting your principles, so they do cost a lot more to have that guarantee, and oftentimes it isn't worth it. Now, structured products, they also carry an additional risk called prepayment risk. Since most of these are debt, uh, debt securities, you do have that risk that they might be prepaid early, for example, for the mortgage-backed securities, if the mortgage is prepaid early, then it will shorten the life of that mortgage-backed security. So we are going to start off by looking at principal protected notes. They do have various features. So a PPN, it is a debt issued by a bank in, in the form of a deposit note. It does have a maturity value uh, or a maturity date, a face value, and a promise to return the principal amount. It also delivers a return in a form of interest. So the interest rate on a principal protected note, it is tied to the performance of an underlying asset, whether it be a stock portfolio, index, mutual fund, ETF, etc. Um, the thing with principal protected notes, however, they are not insured under the CDIC. And in Canada, PPNs are only issued by the six major banks. Um, and zero coupon PPNs, they invest most of the proceeds into a zero coupon bond. And then the remainder is invested in an option where um, they will get the potential return from. There are two different variations of this. You have one that focuses on the participation rate and then another which has the performance cap. So basically, let's look at the participation rate. So say your client invests $5,000 in a five-year PPN linked to the S&P and TSX 60 index. The PPN has a participation rate of 70%. So this basically means that all of the returns that the S&P 500 or TSX 60 index, all those returns that that index does have, um, this principal protected note will only capture 75% of that. So basically the issuer of this PPN always 
ends up making money if if this PPN or if that index increases in value over the five years, which basically always happens. Um, now that is one disadvantage about this. It does have pretty high fees. You're only getting 75% of that return. And the only guarantee you're getting back is your principal being protected. So say that um, the index rises to 1,000 from 750, that's a 33% gain. The return you will be getting on this PPN is going to be 33% times 0.75, which is a 25% return over the five years. So not too bad, but you're still missing out on some return there since you did decide to guarantee your principal rather than just purchase an ETF linked to that index. Now you can also get some PPNs that have the performance cap. So say you are doing the same sort of investment except it has a performance cap of 30%. So if you are doing this, then the return is just capped at a maximum of 30%. So basically if the index earned 33%, you will only earn that 30%. So this is sort of a better way of doing it, I think. Um, the only way that it wouldn't be as effective um, is, of course, if the return was much higher than 30%, then you would want the participation rate instead. Now, say the index only rose by 20%, you would have just earned that 20% um, since it didn't reach the performance cap. You also do have stock basket-linked PPNs. Um, and these are often used with a performance cap. So say there is a performance cap of a 50% return. Um, so you can see that uh, the actual return here, if it is ever above 50%, you'll actually be capped out and you'll only get 50% of that return. You'll take the average of all of these effective returns and that will be the return on your PPN. Now, looking at market-linked GICs, so these are structured a bit differently. They're linked to an index, mutual fund, or ETF, and they combine the guarantee of principal with some growth potential on an equity investment. So they are popular with clients who are extremely conservative investors and they want a guaranteed investment, but also they do want some exposure to the stock market. The downside is that they are locked in until they mature and any returns on market linked GICs are classified as interest income, which of course are taxed higher than dividends and capital gains. So for the example, we have a market linked GIC being purchased for $10,000 um, in a five and it's a five year term. Now, the return is going to be based off the S&P and TSX composite index with a participation rate of 60%. So it is very similar to the PPNs with the participation rate. Um, basically, you will have a certain return from the index. So in this example, the index growth over the period is 39.53%. You're going to multiply that by the 60% participation rate and that's where you're going to get your overall return. So that's basically how market linked GICs work. They are quite similar to the PPNs um, with the participation rate. Now we're going to look at split shares. They're a bit different. Um, they are quite unique and actually quite interesting as well. So a split share, it is a security that divides the investment attributes of an underlying portfolio of common shares into separate components, with each component satisfying a different investment objective. So these investments are created by split share corporations. Now these corporations, they hold common shares of one or more common stock issuers. Then they will issue two types of shares. They'll issue preferred shares and they'll issue capital shares. So the split shares, they're basically split into two. The preferred shares, they'll earn money only from the dividend and the capital shares will earn all of the capital appreciation, but none of the dividend income. So looking at the example for split shares, um, we have this uh, common share from ABC Corp, which trades at $50 and they pay an annual dividend of $1.50 or a 3% dividend yield. 
So we are going to be splitting this common share into the preferred share and the capital share. Um, the preferred share is at a price of 25 and basically you will still get that in, that entire dividend of $1.50. So this increases the yield to 6%. Um, so there is a pretty good benefit there. However, if you are owning the capital share, it's also $25. Um, and it will gain all of the capital appreciation. So say the stock went from $50 to $60, then the capital share will go from $25 to $35. So there is a pretty good advantage to having either of these. Um, it's a nice way to divide the share into two different sort of investment objectives. If you're someone who is looking for uh, an investment that offers a lot more income, then you might want to buy one of these preferred sh split shares. Um, and if you're looking for some serious growth, you might want a capital share. Um, and you could get a lot of capital gains from that if it does increase. And of course, capital gains are priced or are, are taxed um, at the lowest rate. Next, we are going to look at asset backed securities. Now, there is a bit of a process to these. So the process. Um, it aggregates financial assets such as mortgages, loans, and other receivables, and they transform them into a marketable security. So the process has three steps. So first, the originator, a company with income producing assets, groups their assets together it wants to remove from its statement of financial position, and then they'll pool them together into a reference portfolio. So the originator will then sell the pooled assets to a special purpose vehicle controlled by the issuer. This special purpose vehicle is only set up to take the assets off the statement of financial position. And then the issuer finances the purchase of these assets by the special purpose vehicle by selling marketable securities called these asset backed securities. There is three different tiers to asset backed securities. First, you have the senior tier. This is the most credit worthy level and um, they have first claim on any income generated by the special purpose vehicle. Normally the largest of the three levels and it does have the least amount of credit loss risk. The second tier is a mezzanine and this, um, this tranche is paid next. Um, but until this tranche is fully paid, the junior um, tier basically will not get any interest payments. The last tier is that junior tier. It does have the highest credit risk, um, so you might not actually get anything from it. Um, but it does, uh, you're supposed to be compensated for that greater risk by uh, obtaining greater return. So there is a bit of an advantage to that junior tier. You do have the um, expectation of higher return however there is much more risk to it now the structure for asset backed securities is that they are now divided into these three uh, three classes each of these classes they do have their own level of credit risk and it is either a fixed or variable rate of return um, and also asset backed commercial paper it is a type of asset backed securities with a maturity date of less than one year. So next we are going to look at mortgaged MAC securities um, and the structure for these they are a class of income producing structured products designed to provide liquid in the illiquid mortgage market. So mortgage backed securities they are similar to bonds as they carry interest rate risk credit risk and their prices are inversely related to interest rates unlike bonds mortgage backed securities also have prepayment risk they are assumed to have AAA credit quality and an intermediary collects a monthly payment from the issuers of the mortgages and after deducting a fee, they pass them through the mortgage-backed securities holders. They are also protected by the CMHC. And so anyway, that is everything for Chapter 23 of the Canadian Securities course. These are all the most important topics for this chapter. And again, stay tuned for the next chapter.